Good evening. I thought we'd start this evening with a photo of my house. <laughs> I'm Don Raykow, the Elizabeth Newman Wilds director of Cornell Plantations, and we welcome all of you who read the literature and the publicity and the ads on WSKG to learn that we are, in fact, in the call auditorium this evening, rather than our usual home at the Statler Auditorium. Um, I would like to announce that our next lecture, uh, which will be given by Scott Black, the executive director of the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, will be back at the uh, Statler Auditorium two weeks from this evening. But tonight we are celebrating our annual um, lecture in honor of the late Audrey O'Connor. And just yesterday, it was a beautiful day, and I was walking through the Robeson York State Herb Garden and thinking about the tremendous legacy that Audrey O'Connor left for all of us. And what a fitting tribute that part of Audrey's legacy is this annual lecture that has been and continues to be supported by the Orica Herborists. Those of you interested in herbs, wanting to know more about herbs, wanting to interact with other herbalist folks, should look at the literature on the back table about the Orica Herborists, a long-standing group that Audrey had a very strong hand in creating, uh, which continues to meet regularly, often at Cornell Plantations. The individual who will be introducing tonight's speaker is also the same individual who was instrumental in bringing Peter Hatch to Cornell. Uh, Jim Reveal is himself a fascinating individual. He is an adjunct professor at Cornell, uh, working through the Bailey Hortorium. He is an emeritus professor of botany from the University of Maryland, where he served for many years. And he is the honorary curator at the New York Botanical Garden. So without further ado, here is Professor Jim Reveal. Jim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming out this evening. Peter is the just retired director of the Gardens and Crown of Thomas Jefferson Foundation and oversaw the interpretation and restoration of the some 2,400 acres. Those of you who think you have big lots here, consider 2,400 acres um, from 1977 until 2012. A native of Michigan, Peter began his work in, as a horticulturalist at Old Salem before going to Monticello. He took his degrees in English at the University of North Carolina and an AA degree in horticulture from uh, Sand Hill Community College. Understand that at Monticello, he developed numerous education programs and tours for some 35,000 people who annually attended these tours and lecture of the some 450,000 of the annual visitors to the area. So a substantial portion of the people who came to Monticello also came and talked with Peter. He's the author of The Gardens of Monticello, the editor of Thomas Jefferson's Flower Gardens at Monticello. He's written numerous articles and unlike most faculty members, he has lectured in some 35 states. Most faculty members are lucky to go to five. His scholarly studies include the, the, a book on the early American palmology, the flowers and fruits, fruit trees of Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's and the Origin of American Horticulture, published in 1999. Peter's current book uh, entitled a Rich Spot of Earth, Thomas Jefferson's Revolutionary Garden at Monticello is the subject of tonight's lecture. Peter has served as president of the Southern Garden Historical Society from 1980, 1998 to 2000. 
In 2004, he received the Thomas Rowland Medal from the Massachusetts Horticultural Society for exceptional skill, I love that word, skill in horticulture. In 2012, he was named an honorary member of the Garden Club of Virginia and served informally as a consultant to Michelle Obama's White House kitchen garden. In 2011, he received the Garden Club of America's Medal for Historical Preservation, amazingly the first horticulturalist to have ever received this award. And in 2012, Peter was awarded the Flora Ann Bryan a medal, the highest honors given by the Southern Appalachian, uh, Southern Garden uh, History Society. Peter and I have been together off and on for many years, and it is a delight for me to introduce to you Mr. Peter Hatch. Peter? Thanks a lot, Jim. That was great introduction. Well, thanks a lot, Jim. It's a um, it's a real honor, I think, a privilege to be uh, here in Ithaca, this idyllic place, and also at Cornell. Uh, Cornell really represents, in many ways, the, the roots uh, of the study of the history of American horticulture. There was not only the, um, the iconic figure of uh, Liberty Hyde Bailey, who I'm sure many of you might be familiar with, but also um, a number of people who, uh, who, who served in, in Geneva who were great horticultural historians, uh, Ulysses P. Hedrick, uh, Edward Sturdivant, who wrote a book on uh, the history of economic plants, and S.A. Beach, a man who wrote the history of apples, that uh, is a, uh, uh, an amazing and remarkable milestone in the history of study of, uh, of that great fruit. So it's a great honor to be here, um, and uh, also to be a guest of uh, Jim Reveal, who is um, uh, one of the great... Um, uh, botanical and um, horticultural historians in America, uh, following the tradition of, um, of uh, some of the great students of the history of natural history. It was also great to tour a Cornell Plantations, where I last visited in 1981, when it was uh, just a baby, just emerging, and to see it become such a dynamic and um, really lovely uh, institution was really um, a thrill for me today. So thanks so much for, um, for having me. Um, this evening. I'm going to talk about uh, Thomas Jefferson's vegetable garden. Um, Edmund Bacon was Thomas Jefferson's uh, uh, overseer at Monticello, and he recalled that the, the flowers at Monticello uh, bloom virtually every month of the year. And um, when visitors came to, to uh, visit Thomas Jefferson at Monticello, they were often given tours of what one visitor called Mr. Jefferson's pet trees. Uh, Jefferson uh, cultivated 170 varieties of the fanciest uh, fruit cultivars known in the early 1800s. And his, uh, his adventures in, in wine growing and, um, and grape cultivation are constantly recalled by a, a burgeoning Virginia wine industry today. Uh, Jefferson said amazing things like, no nation is drunken when wine is cheap. And wine is indispensable to my health. And um, this uh, emerging Virginia wine industry is uh, constantly recalling Mr. Jefferson today. But it was really a Jefferson's um, a vegetable garden, a, a thousand foot long terrace that was literally hewed out of the side of the mountain that was um, his chief horticultural achievement of his tenure at Monticello. Uh, in fact, when Jefferson used the term garden, he was really reserving the term exclusively for this uh, for this vegetable garden. Uh, it was the garden of Jefferson's retirement years between 1809 and 1826, between the ages of 67 and, and 83. In many ways, it was uh, sort of Jefferson's defiance of age to be able to go into this garden and uh, record when his peas were being uh, sowed in 1809 or when his salsify was recorded and uh, was, was harvested in September of 1814. And even at the age of uh, 83 years old, uh, Jefferson uh, read about giant cucumbers in a Cleveland, Ohio newspaper. And he wrote to the governor of Ohio, Thomas Worthington, and asked him for seeds of this mammoth cucumber. And in real Jeffersonian fashion, he got the seeds and sowed them in his garden and passed them around to his friends and measured how long each one was. 
Um, Jefferson once wrote that, um, although an old man, I am but a young gardener. And here he was at the age of uh, 83, very much playing um, that particular role. Um, Jefferson was a, was a lifelong slave owner. Uh, he regarded slavery as an abominable crime, but never resolved the, the issue himself. Um, and much of the garden labor in the plantation labor was carried out by enslaved African Americans. So there were a lot of exceptions. Um, there were a series of itinerant European gardeners who worked in the gardens, and Jefferson's daughters and granddaughters worked. Um, but what's remarkable, I think, in some ways, was Jefferson's own personal participation in the, in the gardening process. Uh, this is Isaac Jefferson, who was uh, freed after Jefferson died and became a blacksmith in Petersburg, Virginia, when this photograph was taken in the 1850s. And Isaac left an oral history of life at Monticello, and he recalled how Jefferson himself would work in this garden at a right hard pace uh, in the cool of the evening in right good earnest. Um, one of the visitors to Monticello was a was a woman named um, was a woman named Margaret Bayard Smith, and she recalled that there was a portable seed rack that was carried from planting site to planting site, and on the seed rack were hundreds of tin canisters and glass vials of seed, and Jefferson would take the seed himself and actually sow the garden with his own hands. Uh, Jefferson was um, regarded often as the most, uh, among the most cerebral figures in American history, but he was also, he was also really good with his hands. Um, he was the son of a surveyor, and he also had this love of Euclidean geometry, and he was um, always out in the fields uh, measuring things and mapping things. And um, throughout the retirement years, Jefferson was constantly um, shifting the beds in his vegetable garden, and he was out there himself, um, often in February at the age of 67, 71, and 72. He was probably a little bent with age, a little arthritic. Um, the muddy red clay was probably covering his boots. And he was out there with a theodolite, which is kind of like a transit. It measures angles. And he also had a change, chain or a, that measured distances. And he was never really out there with Wormley Hughes, who was an enslaved African-American, uh, sometimes called Monticello's head gardener, a larger-than-life figure at Monticello. And one can see Jefferson um, uh, moving the theodolite from one place to another with the chain and instructing Wormley to strike a, a stick in this particular place and to go over 15 feet and strike another stake. Uh, Isaac, who I showed an image of earlier, said that Jefferson was as neat a hand as any man I've ever seen. Uh, to make locks, keys, uh, small chains with iron and brass in the blacksmith shop at Monticello. So another you know, dimension to uh, America's essential Renaissance man was the fact that he did things actually with his hands himself. Um, I think another remarkable feature of Thomas Jefferson was he was this uh, great recorder of the natural world. Um, Jefferson uh, kept a diary called the Garden Book, and it was 67 pages long, and uh, today it resides at the uh, Massachusetts Historical Society and bound in leather. Uh, one can go home this evening and Google Jefferson's Garden Book and read it online. And it's a remarkable document that reveals um, uh, Jefferson as a garden scientist uh, counting up how many Carolina beans, which would fill a quart jar, which would in turn plant so many feet of row in his garden. And um, this is also a remarkable, one of the remarkable pages from the, from the garden book in which Jefferson is organizing his entire vegetable garden into three sort of tidy categories according to which part of the plant was being harvested, whether fruits, roots, or leaves. And Jefferson was a, was a child of the Enlightenment. He believed in the scientific method that um, measuring and organizing and defining the world around you would lead to human progress and ultimately to human happiness. And he was always cataloging things. And uh, this was kind of a clever way of organizing the whole vegetable world, um, kind of akin to the way Carl Linnaeus organized the whole animal and vegetable world into the two names, a genus and species. Here we have uh, fruits, roots, and leaves, a real window into the uh, enlightenment mind of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, this is another page from Jefferson's Garden Book from 1809, and um, um, 
it shows the repetition of the word failed some 23 times down one of his columns of the plantings that took place in the, right after he retired from the presidency. And one might say the few gardeners failed as often as Thomas Jefferson, or at least uh, wrote about failure as often as he did. Uh, he wrote on one occasion that if he failed um, 99 times out of 100 in his horticultural experiments at Monticello, that one uh, success was worth those 99 failures. Um, Jefferson um, had almost a holistic view of the gardening process. When, um, when the Hessian fly was devouring his wheat crop at Monticello, he seemed much more interested in learning the life cycle of this destructive insect rather than the fact that his wheat crop was about to go down the drain. Uh, he wrote uh, about gardening that in gardening, it's the failure of one thing that is repaired by the success of another. Uh, a wonderful mantra, not only about gardening, but about a lot of other things as well. Uh, when Jefferson was serving as Secretary of State and living in Philadelphia, he got a letter from his daughter Martha, and she complained about the um, insects that were ravaging her cabbage plants in the vegetable garden at Monticello. And he, Jefferson wrote back to her and said the problem with the plants was that they were growing in poor soil. And he said the two of them that winter would cover the entire garden with a heavy coating of manure. He said when plants are growing in rich soil, they will in turn, in Jefferson's words, they'll bid defiance to all sorts of droughts and pests and diseases and weeds and all the things that befall us in a, a gardening summer in central Virginia. So he believed in this balance between wild nature on the one hand and the cultivated garden on the other. Um, sometimes today we think of gardening as being uh, almost warlike and we're out to blast these weeds and wipe out these groundhogs so it's nice to fall back upon Jefferson's more benevolent view of that tension that exists between wild nature and the cultivated garden. Uh, but the garden book um, uh, reflects how, uh, for Jefferson, gardening was a, was a kind of a fun adventure. Um, it reflects really one man's dance with the elements. Um, Jefferson planted different flowering beans along an arbor along the long walk of the garden. He, described the plants like the caracalla bean as the most delicious flowering bean in the world. Uh, he planted purple and white eggplants in adjacent rows in his garden and purple, white, and green sprouting broccolis. And he edged his tomato square with okra. Uh, culinary companions, but kind of a bizarre juxtaposition of plant textures. Uh, he delighted in the odd colored vegetables and multi-headed cabbages and other curiosities of the vegetable world. So gardening for Jefferson was really a, a true uh, a adventure in many ways. Um, the Monticello Vegetable Garden was really an American garden in so many different kinds of ways. It was American in its scale and scope. Uh, this thousand foot long uh, terrace was literally hewed out of the side of the mountain uh, between 1806 and 1809, as Jefferson was anticipating his retirement from the presidency, and he hired seven slaves from a Fredericksburg, Virginia farmer, and over a period of three years, and they were involved in a lot of other plantation activities, uh, they moved uh, some 350,000 cubic feet of earth uh, with a mule and a cart to create this artificial platform that's uh, what one visitor called a hanging garden. It was under the direction of uh, Monticello's overseers, Edwin Bacon. And as Jefferson neared retirement, um, in which he constantly talked about uh, releasing himself from the shackles of the presidency and returning to his books and his family and his gardens in Monticello, uh, he yearned for this uh, terrace garden that was supported by a thousand-foot-long stone wall that in some places was uh, 15 feet in height. And below the wall was a 400-tree orchard that surrounded two vineyards and also berry squares of currants and gooseberries and raspberries and figs. And it was all surrounded by a 10-foot-high solid board fence that ran for nearly a 1,000 feet in length. So really a, a big garden, an American in scale and scope in a lot of different ways. And secondly, I think it was an American garden in... Um, in sort of its experimental character. Uh, Jefferson wrote that the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. And he documented in this garden the, the culture of some 330 varieties of 
89 different species of culinary vegetables. It was uh, really a, uh, an Alice Island, if you will, of new and unusual plants from around the world. And Jefferson himself became this sort of uh, seedy missionary as he would obtain rare seeds from around the world and pass them around to his friends and neighbors and other great American plantsmen. Uh, from the Texas bird pepper that Jefferson got from a um, San Antonio, Texas uh, army captain um, that he passed around to some of the great gardeners in America at the time. Uh, to the sesame plant, uh, Jefferson was primarily a vegetarian. He said he ate meat only as a condiment to his meals and he was forever seeking a good salad oil for the preparation of his vegetables. And when he was president, he had a blind tasting of salad oils in the White House. And uh, people found the sesame oil preferable to olive oil. And that set off this typically grand Jefferson obsession with growing sesame year in and year out in his vegetable garden. And uh, he developed three different presses to extract the oil from the seed itself. Uh, he failed numerous times, but continued planting sesame to um, uh, the very last years of his life and uh, encouraged Congress members to uh, give away medals to a southern production of sesame oil. Um, uh, to the Rose de May, um, the Rose de May uh, cabbage, which uh, Jefferson sent home from Paris, uh, a beautiful cabbage that uh, has this uh, Savoy cabbage with variegated leaves. Uh, to the rutabaga among the root crops in the upper right-hand corner of this image. And um, it's really hard to prove that Jefferson actually introduced himself for the first time any vegetable into American gardens, but probably the best argument could be made for the rutabaga. Uh, it was only being grown a year before in England in 1792, when Jefferson began growing it in 1793 at Monticello. So among Jefferson's many accomplishments, the Lewis and Clark expedition and the third president of the United States and penning the, inner, the uh, Declaration of Independence, we might include uh, Thomas Jefferson as the rutabaga man. <laughs> I think the garden was also, um, I think the garden was also American in a sort of continental panorama, the way it was sliced into the hillside of this uh, mountain in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, giving you this uh, 60 mile view across the Piedmont of Virginia toward Richmond, Virginia to the southeast. Or if you look to the southwest, um, you see the kind of dramatic uplift of a, of a mountain Jefferson called Montalto. Montalto meaning the high mountain as opposed to Monticello, which means the little mountain. And um, the Garden Pavilion was uh, constructed uh, in 1812 at the halfway point of the garden. It was also called a, a temple by Jefferson. Um, but two people who came to Monticello referred to it as an observatory. So you get a sense about how this garden was really this consciously designed perch to uh, look off into the distance. And um, Jefferson cited uh, Monticello in many ways for its intimacy with what he called the workhouse of nature. He said and wrote uh, How Sublime to Look Down Upon the Workhouse of Nature, Clouds, Thunder, Lightning, All Fabricated at Our Feet. And um, this garden was uh, consciously designed for that uh, view of the, the workhouse of nature. Uh, I think the garden also was not just an American garden, but it was a revolutionary garden in the sense that one wonders if any man had grown so many different kinds of vegetables before Jefferson assembled this lifetime over a collection of, or, or a lifetime of, of vegetable gardening at Monticello. And most gardens in Virginia were really bare in the middle of the summertime, around 1800. Uh, gardeners were generally relying on uh, what Jefferson called the esculent plants of Europe, uh, old world, cool season vegetables, um, root crops, lettuce family members, cabbage family members that um, thrive in um, cool temperatures but uh, suffer a lot in the hot, humid summers of, uh, of Virginia. And uh, uh, what Jefferson did that was really special was he growing a lot of things that we kind of take for granted today, um, uh, beginning with the tomato or tomatoes to uh, hot peppers, uh, to eggplants, to okra, uh, from lima beans to sweet potatoes to peanuts to crowder peas. And um, um, again, we kind of take these things to, for granted today, but they're really hot season vegetables that thrive in the microclimate of this south-facing garden at Monticello. Uh, the garden was also really revolutionary because it really broke from the traditions of the uh, old world European kitchen garden. Um, um, 
And um, in its pragmatism and this practicality, this garden was kind of different in many different ways. And uh, the old world kitchen garden was uh, expressed in the gardening literature that was in Thomas Jefferson's library at Monticello. And particularly in England, um, these kitchen gardens were really bustling, sophisticated villages of horticulture. And a lot of the energy uh, that was devoted to the gardening was uh, energy to bring vegetables uh, uh, to the table out of season, and really in some ways to defy the cold, cloudy European, particularly the British climate. And gardeners used a variety of techniques to uh, bring things uh, out of season to the table. They used, um, uh, they used brick walls to grow fruit upon in order to use the heat radiating from the walls to hasten the fruiting of things like pears and peaches and, and apples. Uh, they used bell jars and uh, hothouses and greenhouses. But really the central technique was what were called hotbeds. And in this image um, on the left hand, lower left hand side is a hotbed. It's basically a cold frame that is uh, dug out and filled at the very base with about a foot of uh, unfermented raw manure or raw tan bark. And then it's covered with soil and then um, uh, these windows are put over the frame and you create this warm greenhouse as the fermentation of the manure heats up this uh, little glass house and enables gardeners to harvest asparagus in December or bring melons to the, uh, to the table in, um, in, um, in late March. And um, this uh, tradition was, was alive and well in, uh, in Virginia, and Jefferson had seen it when he was serving as minister to France, and he went to these great kitchen gardens like at, uh, at Versailles. Uh, these were really sophisticated gardeners and uh, really um, uh, expressed the, the greatest hits of the, of the gardener's skill. And it was expressed some in, in early American gardens in Virginia around 1800 uh, among the, the wealthiest Virginians, uh, people like George Washington at Mount Vernon or John Taylor at, um, at uh, Mount Airy, uh, who had um, European gardeners and uh, they used hotbeds. And um, uh, if you look at the work reports of some of these gardeners at places like Mount Vernon, uh, you see they're doing um, also a lot of kind of tidying superficial jobs in the garden. They were edging beds and they were uh, weeding walkways and they were mowing the lawns. Um, Jefferson never talks about how he took care of plants at Monticello. It's all about sowing things and bringing them to table. Um, one um, Virginia horticulturist wrote in 1838, comparing the gardening styles in England with those in America, and he said, well, the Englishman prepares his borders while the American digs his holes. Uh, an apt, I think, uh, image of the differences in the styles of the two continents in some ways in the gardening process. And the real genius of Jefferson's garden in Monticello was this microclimate that enabled Jefferson to grow vegetables all winter long and also to, um, uh, to reserve um, the summertime for a lot of these hot season vegetables that hadn't really been introduced into American gardens. Um, and this wasn't a very fussy garden. Uh, like I said, Jefferson never took, uh, in his garden notes, never talked about how he took care of things or whether he watered them or whether he manured them or whether he uh, used this particular technique to get rid of um, aphids on his um, fava beans. It's all about sowing and experimenting and harvesting and bringing things to the tables. Um, so an interesting perception, and I think this revolutionary garden really inspired a, a revolutionary cuisine in the kitchen at Monticello. And um, we know a lot about uh, food at Monticello because of uh, Jefferson's uh, granddaughters wrote down the family recipes from their mother, who was Jefferson's daughter, Martha uh, Jefferson Randolph. And among the recipes is a, is a wonderful, interesting recipe for um, uh, okra soup, or in effect, gumbo. And this has vegetables that were grown by, um, by uh, North American and Virginia Indians when the Europeans first arrived, like patty pan squash, which Everson called simlins, and um, lima beans. Uh, it also had tomatoes that were uh, found by the Spanish in Central America and actually became pretty popular very early on in the, uh, Euro in the Mediterranean countries, in France and Italy and Spain. Uh, there were potatoes in this gumbo recipe, and potatoes, of course, are an Andean vegetable that were introduced into Europe by the Spanish and became very popular, not in southern Europe, but in northern Europe, in the Scandinavian countries and the British Isles. Then this dish was all brought together by an African plant, okra, that was brought to the Caribbean in slave ships and uh, creolized 
in terms of its cuisine by the French in the Caribbean. Then okra seeds were brought into uh, the young United States by, uh, by slaves, and uh, then this whole dish was put together in the Monticello kitchen by enslaved African Americans who were trained in the finest arts of French cuisine, both in the president's house in Washington, but also in the kitchens uh, of, uh, of Paris when Jefferson was serving as minister to France. So what a great amalgam of all, all these different traditions that not only went into the vegetable garden at Monticello, but also went into the, uh, the kitchen at Monticello to kind of define um, what we call, we call the, a new American cuisine. Uh, began to define who we are as, uh, as Southerners and Virginians as Americans. This sort of great internationalism in many ways. Uh, the cuisine of Monticello was described as being uh, half Virginian and half French. And Monticello probably represented more of the French side, while they, uh, or the Virginia side, excuse me, while the President's House in Washington probably represented more of the uh, French side. And Jefferson, uh, while he was president, kept a, um, what's been called a master plan of presidential meals. And it's written down in French and probably copied verbatim from his uh, French chef, a man named Honoré Julien. And among the many recipes was one for uh, what could be called French fries. And uh, one of the uh, great uh, food historians in America, a woman named uh, Karen Hess, a, a tough cookie who constantly lambasts uh, food fake lore, uh, makes a good case that this could really be a, a Jefferson introduction into American cuisine of the French fry, at least uh, by way of his French chef. Um, when Jefferson was, uh, was president, uh, he also kept a, a chart over the eight years of his presidency of the very first and last appearance of 37 different vegetables in the farmer's market of Washington, D.C. Uh, a mar remarkable document, a real window into early American vegetable cuisine. And according to one of his friends, a woman named Margaret Bayard Smith, uh, Jefferson would go around to foreign embassies when he was president, and they would vie with each other to give Jefferson the most unusual type of vegetable. And he would get the seeds and pass them out to uh, local farmers with directions on how to grow these things. And then he in turn ordered his uh, French household administrator, a man named Etienne Le Maire, uh, to pay the highest prices for the best looking tomatoes or the earliest cauliflowers that came into market. And uh, in turn, Le Maire kept a, a log of all the purchases for President's House meals in 1806. And it's amazing to see how, you know, uh, Lettuce was purchased 107 times, and parsley was bought 93 different occasions from this farmer's market. But of course, we're always looking for models for the things we're interested in today, um, local food and farmer's markets. And here was Thomas Jefferson um, fostering these markets um, uh, and setting a real foundation for, um, for local farmers some 200 years ago. And uh, Jefferson's garden wasn't the only garden at Monticello. Um, enslaved um, African Americans had their own gardens out on the plantation on the 5,000 acres that Jefferson owned where they'd cultivate crops and uh, grow chickens and eggs for sale to the Jefferson family and also probably to eat themselves. And this sort of underground economy was mostly expressed in, um, on Sunday mornings when Jefferson's members of Jefferson family would go out and actually purchase um, cucumbers and, and squashes and um, cabbages and potatoes from, from slaves at Monticello. And uh, many of the purchases were taking place when the Monticello Vegetable Garden was relatively dormant, when Jefferson was away or when early on in his career at Monticello or, or very late in his lifetime. But um, when Jefferson was president, his granddaughter, a woman named Ann Carey, Ann Carey Randolph, uh, between the ages of 14 and 17, between 1805 and 1808, her job was to go out on Sunday morning and make these purchases. And um, uh, it was sort of a rite of passage. And uh, one wonders at this real intersection of black and white worlds, you know, who was driving the hard bargain? This 14-year-old girl or else one of these wizened um, uh, expert slave gardeners at Monticello. Uh, in some ways, the more you know, the more you think and the more you uh, speculate about them the worlds of the past. Um, there was a garden right here where that cattle guard is today. Um, in the distance is uh, Jefferson's Little Mountain, or Monticello. Um, and this, the gardens were taken care of by slaves, usually on uh, Sundays or on, um, on, um, in the evenings. 
Um, one of the interesting facets of the purchase is that a lot of things were sold um, to the Jefferson family out of season. That is, um, apples were sold in April, or um, cucumber. A cucumber was sold to the Jefferson family in February, and uh, cabbages were sold every month of the year. And there was really a conscious effort to um, to store and preserve a lot of these vegetables so they'd be more valuable out of season to the uh, Jefferson family. But an interesting case of sort of this uh, alternative economy that was going on at Monticello that was very, very interesting. Um, Jefferson had a lot of favorite, favorite vegetables. Um, it's hard to find a vegetable he didn't like. Um, often the uh, garden pea is uh, regarded as his favorite. Uh, he grew some uh, 27 different varieties of English pea, and uh, he reserved uncommon amount of garden real estate to cultivating peas, and um, uh, he had this heavily choreographed planting season where he'd plant at different times of the season, early, mid, and late season peas. He'd not only write when, about when his peas were planted, but he'd write about when they came out of the ground and when they first flowered and first formed pods. Uh, Jefferson had famous uh, contests with his neighbors to see who could bring the, the first English pea to the table in the springtime, the winners hosting the losers over for a community dinner that included a feast on the winning dish of peas. And the family tradition is that Jefferson rarely won the contest uh, except for 1814. And um, there was a Jefferson neighbor who was probably Jefferson's best friend outside the world of politics. He was a man named uh, George Divers who lived at what is now Farmington Country Club, and Jefferson designed the, um, the octagon part of the uh, front of that house. And um, the story goes that Jefferson uh, won the contest in 1814, but he didn't want to divulge the fact that Mr. Divers, in fear of rocking the pride of his good friend, and according to Jefferson's granddaughter, Jefferson was the least competitive gardener of any man she'd ever known. And divers had an important role at Monticello. Um, Jefferson would get these seeds from all over the world, and uh, um, he'd sow them at Monticello, but he'd also pass them around to his friends and his neighbors. And so when Jefferson would kill them at Monticello, he could always go back to Mr. Divers or one of his other neighbors and get replacement supplies. It was a good lesson for all gardeners that... Um, that um, you share what you have and it can come back to benefit you in the future. And um, we also know a lot about food uh, at Monticello from a, a cookbook that was written by this woman, Mary Randolph. Uh, it was called The Virginia Housewife and it was published in Richmond, Virginia in 1824 and she was Thomas Jefferson's second cousin. And um, um, there was this um, repetition of a lot of the recipes in Mary Randolph's cookbook and the recipes found in the Jefferson family um, um, uh, documents at the University of Virginia, suggesting that there was a relationship between the two families. Uh, Mary Randolph was living in hard times. She ran a boarding house in, in Virginia. But her book is remarkable, The Virginia Housewife, probably the most influential cookbook of the 19th century, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the recipes for the preparation of a lot of these unusual vegetables Jefferson was growing at Monticello. And, um, she has a lot of recipes for growing for 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 for, um, for peas. Uh, she boiled them with onion, mint, and lots of butter. A common way of uh, eating fresh peas today. Although fresh peas you don't see in people's gardens as often as you used to. And uh, Jefferson's granddaughter, uh, who I showed you an image of earlier, she boiled and sautéed the peas with egg yolk, onion, cloves, and brown sugar to make this sort of sweet custardy sauce. I don't know if it sounds that good to me, but. Um, um, bless her heart. Um, <laughs> lettuce was a, was a favorite of Jefferson's. Um, uh, he uh, he uh, recorded harvesting lettuce every month of the year at Monticello, and uh, one year he sowed it 25 times, and one year um, he loved lettuce and he had to have it all the time. Uh, lettuce in Virginia gets bitter, uh, milky, and sappy in the summertime, and it was inevitably probably boiled like you would spinach maybe today. Um, Jefferson compiled this, um, this uh, gardening calendar uh, in a national publication in 1824 called The American Farmer. And The American Farmer was published in Baltimore, and it was sort of a journal of progressive agriculture. And he penned this, um, this garden calendar, which was uh, the common way of dispensing garden advice in the early 19th century. You know, every month of the year you do certain things. And among the words of advice that Jefferson had for this national audience and, um, was to sow uh, a thimble full of lettuce, he said, should be sowed every Monday morning 
from February 1st until September 1st. So think about that a little bit. The, the first thing you do when you get up for the work week is to go out and sow a thimble full of lettuce, as if that's a life lesson akin to cleaning your dinner plate or brushing your teeth every day, and that sowing that Monday morning lettuce will lead to um, moral virtue and longevity and all the good things in life. And in fact, um, looking at the documents, you know, Jefferson sowed lettuce um, some 140 times and 80 times it was on a Monday. Um, so he was kind of following what he preached to some extent, but later in his life he, he started disregarding the, uh, the summertime plantings of lettuce for just planting it in the cool season. Uh, the brown Dutch lettuce was a favorite of his to sow in September for harvesting through the winter months. And the tennis ball lettuce was another favorite variety of Jefferson's, but he reserved it for this, um, for this other house of his at Poplar Forest. Uh, which is 60 miles south of Monticello. He built it in his retirement years to get away from all the celebrity tourists who were coming to Monticello. And um, he would visit there for months at a time. Uh, going back to the peas, um, when Jefferson would go to visit Poplar Forest, his neighbors would go out of the way to start their gardens really early so they could have fresh peas to give to Jefferson when he arrived in this uh, Lynchburg second home. And it became associated with... Uh, with Jefferson, like you know, jelly beans were with uh, Ronald Reagan, or um, or um, I guess a lot of the current presidents uh, don't like uh, certain vegetables, and so we know more about that than what we like. Um, the cabbage was a real garden workhorse for Jefferson. He grew and documented planting some 35 different varieties of cabbage. Um, um, uh, uh, Mary Randolph wrote in her book that cabbage should be as beautiful dressed, that is cooked as when growing in the ground in the garden. And um, Jefferson had as a personal recipe for um, stuffed cabbage, where he cut out the heart of it and filled it with meat and other sorts of vegetables, one of his few recipes. Um, uh, on Christmas Eve of 1823, uh, Jefferson noted in his account book buying uh, 79 cabbages um, from Gil Gillette, one of the more productive family of enslaved gardeners at Monticello. And again, to this intersection of black and white worlds, one wonders what Jefferson was doing with 79 cabbages on Christmas Eve. Were these presents for the community? Were they decorations for the house? Were they uh, for a huge quantity of, of, uh, of a Virginia-style coleslaw? Um, when Jefferson was uh, about to retire to Monticello from um, serving as Secretary of State in Philadelphia, he wrote to his daughter Martha, and said, well, I can't wait to come home to Monticello to my family and my books and my friends, and I can't wait for us uh, when we can sow our cabbages together. Uh, so the sort of modest, humble vegetable is used as an image for familial happiness. Uh, another favorite, uh, kind of an unusual vegetable, sea kale, uh, which is a, a perennial cabbage that grows uh, along the beaches of Great Britain. And in the springtime, the sea kale comes up out of the ground along the beaches and it's covered by shifting beach sand, and that prevents the production of chlorophyll, and it makes the leaves, when they're cut off and, and cooked, a, a little less bitter tasting. And in the garden, people would use artificial means to blanch the sea kale by using, um, in most cases, sea kale pots. And uh, Jefferson ordered um, sea kale pots from a Richmond potter, and then later in the season, like with an asparagus, you let the plants out into the sun and let them grow to produce food for the following year. And it's an interesting vegetable. Jefferson um, would, would send it away, seeds away to friends and say, well, cook it like you would asparagus. Uh, when the plants get to be eight or ten inches high, it's cut off. But Jefferson spent a lot more time in the garden than he did in the kitchen. And uh, a constant thing he'd tell people when he'd send them vegetable seeds, well, just make it like you would asparagus. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and Jefferson got seed of this from his favorite nurseryman, who was a, a Philadelphian named Bernard McMahon. And McMahon was, a, was um, a source of a lot of plants for the gardens of Monticello. He also wrote the best book on gardening, published in the first half of the 19th century, a book called The American Gardener's Calendar. But Jefferson got seed of the sea kale, and he sowed it in his garden, and there's no references uh, to harvesting it in his garden book. And then a few years later, he... Uh, got uh, plants from this man who was another neighbor. His name was John Hartwell Cock, and he lived at a place called Bremo, a, a, a beautiful place along the James River. And suddenly, um, suddenly, um, uh, Jefferson's garden book is filled with the dates upon which sea kale is harvested every year. 
Uh, my CKL chapter is titled Friends to the Rescue. And again, that's how um, a lot of successes came about at Monticello. Uh, the tomatoes uh, were, were spelled by Jefferson T-O-M-A-T-A-S, suggesting he was pronouncing it like tomatoes. I think that's right. And um, you know, he cultivated it as a culinary vegetable for um, some uh, 20 years in the gardens at Monticello. And there's 19 recipes in Mary Randolph's uh, a Virginia Housewife cookbook uh, for pr preparation of tomatoes. Um, you know, the tomatoes were introduced into Europe um, in the um, 1500s. Um, I think they really um, uh, blew away the earliest uh, commentators on plants who are basically almost medieval in their awe of um, the natural world. And, you know, here's a plant with these, uh, this strong growing vining, stinky leaves and this, uh, this really, uh, large um, lap, lap wedding fruit uh, with really red colors to it and also gold colors. So I think it struck a lot of the early herbalists um, um, as being almost too sensuous for its own good. And so it became associated with a lot of um, um, unpleasant other nightshade family plants. And I think over the years also there was this real sort of European nativism about the tomato. It was uh, consumed in great uh, quantities, of course, in, in the Mediterranean countries. But for Northern Europeans, particularly the British, uh, this is always something that just, well, the Spanish would eat or the Italians would make, but no civilized Northern European would eat the tomato. And so I think there was sort of a, a nativism in regard to the uh, acceptance of the tomato. Uh, Jefferson's son-in-law, uh, was a man named Thomas Mann Randolph, and he went on to become the governor of Virginia. But in 1824, he gave a speech before the local uh, Albemarle Agricultural Society, which was an organization of progressive farmers, and his speech was on plant introductions and how they'd improve people's lives. And he talked about how in uh, 1814, 10 years later, earlier, no one in Charlottesville and the surrounding communities was eating tomatoes, but by 1824, he said everyone was eating them because they believed they quicken the blood in the summertime, whatever that might mean. You can see these, uh, these furrowed and, uh, and uh, uh, lopsided tomatoes that uh, express the character of a 18th and 19th century tomato. Uh, this is a favorite variety of mine called purple calabash, and here's a purple calabash which sometimes turns almost black, and beyond it is an Italian variety called Castelluto Genovese. Um, but the history of the tomato is... Uh, is really a, a rich one. And um, um, the turnip in the uh, early 19th century, however, was uh, kind of to the 19th century garden what the tomato is to our garden today. It was really the queen of the garden in so many different ways because of its versatility and ability to have turnips almost uh, every month of the season. And um, uh, the richest man in Virginia around the time of the American Revolution was a man named Landon Carter who lived at Sabin Hall along the Rappahannock River, and he had really elaborate gardens and uh, these terrace gardens that went down to the Rappahannock, and the topmost garden was a, uh, was a, um, a very fancy flower garden um, illustrated here in this conjectural image or reconstruction of it. And um, Lennon Carter was, a, you know, he was a kind of a cranky guy, and one summer he got really depressed. Um, it was a long drought and his flowers weren't doing well, and he had gout and wasn't feeling too good. And so he decided to plow up his uh, formal flower garden and plant turnips. And this gave uh, Mr. Carter a lot of satisfaction. He said, well, at least I can eat the turnips. And uh, uh, the turnip was, uh, there was two other instances um, by contemporaries of Jefferson of them tearing up their lawns and planting turnips right around the house. Uh, John Hartwell Cock, who I showed you an image of earlier, and another uh, contemporary of Jefferson who lived in Orange, Virginia, about 25 miles away. Both of them plowed up their lawns to plant turnips. And of course, today we have these um, edible landscaping people who urge us to tear up our lawns to plant vegetables. And here's another example where they're doing it 200 years ago. Uh, the salsify was a favorite. Uh, the oyster plant was a favorite of Jefferson's. Um, um, his, uh, his daughter, Ann Carey Randolph, had a, had a series of recipes for preparing it. Um, one recipe involved boiling the roots and then um, squashing them up and breading them a little bit and frying them like sausages. And um, it's a nice cross between an artichoke heart and an oyster, and uh, uh, salsify was uh, big in the Jefferson family table. Uh, a favorite uh, turnip recipe for the Jefferson family was uh, turnips with cheese, suggesting maybe a little bit of uh, Jefferson 19th century comfort food. 
Um, people have asked me what was Jefferson's, um, what was there a vegetable he didn't like, and I've always had struggled with that particular, um, particular question. Um, uh, Jefferson described cucumbers as a great favorite, um, but uh, there's a family sort of joke about how uh, Jefferson, on July 1st of 1826, went out into his garden and ate a cucumber, and he was never well after eating that cucumber, and he died three days later. So my cucumber chapter is titled "Killed by Cucumbers," um, um, and uh, the you know the stories of um, of uh, cucumber contests were legendary in Virginia before Jefferson was even born. Um, in the 1730s, there was a um, there was an avid gardener in Williamsburg, Virginia, named John Custis, who got uh, cucumbers of a, of a of a of great size from uh, his um, plant mentor, a man named Peter Collinson. Custis gave him to his son-in-law who lived uh, near Richmond. And, um, and his son-in-law grew these cucumbers and they were five and six feet long. And uh, the Virginia Gazette, which was the newspaper in Williamsburg, reported about how people were riding 10 or 12 miles to see these uh, giant cucumbers. And um, this guy in Boston read about these stories about these giant Virginia cucumbers, and he wrote a letter to the editor saying, well, yeah, I'd like to see your giant cucumbers, but where do you see my 500-pound watermelons? So it set off this mock civil war between these two um, entities about who had the biggest vegetable. Um, and my original cucumber chapter title was going to be Boys Will Be Boys, but I decided that <laughs> Killed by Cucumber might be more interesting. And this is um, a 15... Uh, 16th century image of a, of a cucumber showing um, sort of how the smooth cucumber we know today was, um, was not in cultivation, at, the, at least at that point. And this was a favorite uh, summer vegetable for Jefferson, the West Indian gherkin, and these were pickled. Uh, it was another common plant that he planted in the heat of the summertime at Monticello. Um, his um, French maitre d' recorded buying um, uh, barrels of, of, of gherkins for the, uh, for the president's house in Washington. And obviously, guests to the White House were served um, pickled gherkins in a barrel, just like um, we often do today. Uh, this garden was put back at Monticello um, in the early 1980s, and um, 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 between 1978 and 1979, and this is an image of Monticello um, in 1975, and it shows um, parking lots, that, the asphalt parking lots that really went up right to the very um, porch of the house itself where large buses were surely running their air conditioners uh, 25 feet from the east portico of Monticello. And um, uh, this garden uh, was restored in the 19, like I said, the early 1980s based on Jefferson's uh, wealth of documentary record, but also on uh, years of archaeological excavations. Uh, every time you disturb our heavy red clay soil, you leave some sort of lasting imprint in terms of the texture or the color of the soil itself so that archaeologists, by very carefully troweling off the soil, can see stains where trees were growing hundreds of years ago, where fence posts were, um, were planted hundreds of years ago. And this image shows an aerial view, and it shows um, in the left center of your screen uh, where the archaeologists put newspapers over where they found uh, tree hole stains uh, that suggested where Jefferson's South Orchard trees were planted. And it formed actually a, a pattern, a grid pattern, that uh, was pretty close to a 1778 map that Jefferson had drawn of this uh, South Orchard, as he called it. And along the left-hand part of your screen, you can see a closer spacing of white dots. Every 10 feet apart was where the archaeologists found um, stains of fence posts. And these fence posts um, were uh, representing Jefferson's um, uh, solid board fence that ran for nearly 4,000 feet uh, surrounding this entire fruit and vegetable garden complex. It was 10 feet high and had boards so close together that according to Jefferson, not even a young hare could get between them. And this was actually right here was the entrance to the garden. Um, it had a lock and a key. Uh, the fence was there to keep out wild and domestic animals, but also probably to keep out people. Um, and uh, this whole terrace was supported by a stone wall that had disappeared in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And here, archaeologists uncovering remnants of the wall, but also the foundation for that garden temple or the garden pavilion that was restored in 1984. And um, it's a, a classical building, a 12 and a half feet square with triple sash windows and a pyramidal roof and a 
Chinese railing along the top. It's the only garden structure that uh, Jefferson built that was an independent structure. The story goes it was blown down in a rather violent windstorm in the 1820s, a year after Jefferson died, and it really is perched kind of precariously atop that stone wall. The story also goes it was a favorite place for Jefferson to read in the cool evening. And um, I came to Monticello in 1977, so it's been, um, I have an interesting sort of um, perspective because not only was I active in restoring the garden as a young buck back in 1978, but I also have taken care of that garden for some 35 years as the uh, director of gardens and orchards. And the garden's important. Uh, its legacy, I think, is really particularly profound. It's inspired uh, a lot of art uh, today. Um, this is an overhead view of the garden, an aerial view. And uh, this woman, um, a number of years ago, did a tapestry that was 20 feet long uh, of that aerial view of the garden itself. And it was uh, displayed at the uh, Chicago Institute of Art and it's really a, a beautiful thing. I can't remember her name right offhand. Uh, she did a wonderful tapestry of the harvest from the gardens, of the roots, fruits, and leaves. This is actually all roots in this image. Um, the really famous photographer Annie Leibovitz came uh, really just a year and a half ago uh, to take pictures of, a, of Monticello for a book called Pilgrimages. And uh, she was really interested in the garden because she was a disciple of this uh, mid-20th century English photographer named Edward Jones who takes these really stark, uh, basic photographs of, uh, of, a, of a potato or of a turnip or of a cabbage. And so I would go into the garden with Annie Leibovitz and I'd, I'd pull up a, a bunch of beets and I'd throw them on the ground and she'd take the picture. I'd pull up a bunch of, uh, dig some sweet potatoes and throw them on the ground. And she said, oh, you know, you have, you have great hands. And I, you know, I looked at my eye, the grubbiest little hands you've ever seen. So she was obviously trying to get more vegetables out of me. <laughs> uh, and then, um, this is a picture she took. And then um, I started complaining about my book, how I had trouble getting a professional photographer to be at the right time, at the right place in the garden. And she said, oh, you have a great eye. You should be taking your own pictures. Here, take my camera. You can have my camera. So she gave me her camera. It was like Babe Ruth's bat. It, has, it hadn't helped my photographic skills, unfortunately. But uh, it was uh, suggesting how the, you know, the garden um, inspires people today. Uh, Alice Waters, sort of the, the mother of, um, of a vegetarian cuisine with fresh organic produce, um, um, came to Monticello. She wrote an introduction to, to this book that um, I'm talking about. But she also came to Monticello this past April and um, made a dinner for 350 people on the West Lawn at Monticello. And uh, she brought 12 world-class chefs with her and uh, you know, washed the lettuce from the garden herself, and she milked a cow on the West Lawn for the dinner. It was a great, great meal, but she said it was the most important meal she'd ever made uh, because of um, a testament to Jefferson as, um, as the American figure who was first in food and first in wine and, and, and really first in gardening in so many different ways. And Michelle Obama said that this White House kitchen garden is perhaps the most important thing she'd ever done in her life. And um, um, I've made friends over the years with um, the White House chefs, and they, they were kind of novice gardeners, and they would come down to the Monticello Gardener, and I'd you know, inspire them about Thomas Jefferson and show them how to plant beets. And um, they'd go back, and they took a lot of Jefferson varieties, because we had this collection of, of uh, Jefferson varieties of seed, and um, they... Uh, reserved a special part in the garden for um, a garden tribute to Thomas Jefferson uh, in Jefferson's honor with this quote about the failure of one thing being repaired by the success of another. And um, the last three springs I've gone up for ceremonial plantings with school children. Um, that's always been quite exciting. At the, when the world's fallen apart, it's nice, to, um, it's nice to dig your hands in the earth of the White House garden, all these earthworms, and it's just sort of a a positive affirmation of a man's best spirits. Um, good soil makes for a good civilization. Um, and still today, we have a uh, we have a, a, a festival at Monticello in the in the fall every year in September, which um, tries to exploit people's interests in organic gardening and um, uh, local food and seed saving and uh, sustainable agriculture. And we have a big festival with um, this year. We had five or six thousand people on the west lawn with. Uh, hundreds of educational programs and vendors and uh, cooking demonstrations and uh, using the gardens as a, as a laboratory, but also as a way to, um, to um, look to the past uh, in order to define uh, the future ahead in many ways. 
So that's about the end of my formal remarks, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, we don't, you know, we don't know anything about uh, hop varieties. He, he just, hops were hops for Jefferson, and so we don't have any clue. And I, you know, I wonder how many hop cultivars were around in the, um, around 1800. I, it's something that I haven't explored. I probably should have. Uh, but hops were a, were, were a big success story in the sense that Jefferson's always, uh, he's recalled by this burgeoning Virginia wine industry today, but mostly as a failed uh, grape grower and winemaker. Uh, but he made a great cider, and there was a lot of beer made at Monticello. Uh, he actually had a brewmaster who um, arrived at Monticello in, in 1814. He was an English sailor who was really involved in the War of 1812, and he was shipwrecked on the coast of Virginia. Uh, but he, for some reason, he came to Monticello, and Jefferson hired him as a brewmaster, and he made um, a Monticello ale that... Um, was really the uh, toast of the local community. Uh, a lot of Jefferson's neighbors would send uh, their overseer to learn how to make beer from this guy. And he went away, and Jefferson never wrote, by, wrote down the recipe for his beer. But his, uh, his wife, Martha, also has a recipe for, um, for, for making beer at Monticello. Uh, hops were grown in the garden. Uh, there was a good uh, space reserved for the hops in the vegetable garden. And there were also... Um, Unusually heavy purchases of hops from uh, enslaved gardens, um, um, pounds and pounds of hops, and you know a pound of hops is a lot of hops. And um, Squire uh, was a was a, a slave at Monticello, had probably the most sophisticated garden, uh, the most um, wide range of types of plants, and he grew hops that were sold to the Jefferson family. But hops was a big success story. But I don't know what kind of you know, the people ask me all the time, and I don't. I have to. I have to go back and look at that because I don't. I really don't think that hops were. I'm sure there were varieties of hops, but um, um, I'm not sure they were appearing in American nurseries. Any other questions? Yes, yes, sir. In the back. Oh, that's ma'am. Excuse me. My eyes are not that good. Yeah, we do. We do that uh, pretty much, but. Um, Jefferson, this is really interesting, Jefferson was this great believer in rotation of crops, and uh, when he returned from being minister to France, he came back to Monticello, and it was just, the farms were just really a mess, erosion and uh, impoverished soil, so he became sort of a reformist in terms of agriculture, and really devoted himself to at least um, writing down um, all these different proposals for the uh, revolution and reviving his farms. And, you know, uh, 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 contour plowing and the rotation of crops was really integral to this system. But in the Monticello Vegetable Garden in his retirement years, you know, he planted his peas and his beans and his beets in the same place every year. And uh, it's always kind of blown my mind, really, that, uh, that he would do that. Um, but in fact, you know, he kept doing it, doing it, doing it. It wasn't like, um, I think it kept working. I don't think he would have kept doing it if it hadn't um, if it hadn't worked well. So, it's, you know, I, I don't know what to say, but it's kind of interesting. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Is there what any? Yeah, my book has a whole chapter. If you want to buy the book, <laughs> uh, you could probably you could probably find um, get information on our on our website as well. If you don't want to buy the book, you can get it free over the internet. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What's that? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, he was a great. He loved olive oil. He described it as manna from heaven. And um, early on in his tenure at Monticello, he experimented with olive trees. And olive trees will often grow at Monticello. They'll never produce olives, but they sometimes will grow and then get killed to the ground and then come up from the roots every year. And um, years ago, in 1993, uh, there was an olive oil convention in New York City, and this olive oil company imported a, a 60-year-old olive tree from Santa Barbara, California, and showed it off at this convention in New York City. And at the end of the convention, they didn't know what to do with the olive tree, so this guy called me and said, well, do you want our olive tree? And I said, sure. You know, I thought it would at least, uh, if it didn't, uh, it would at least suck her up from the roots and make an olive bush every year. 
And so this guy, you know, he hired a, a, a tractor trailer to bring this, uh, this 10 ton tree down to Charlottesville and I hired a crane to put it in the ground and put it in the ground around June and it had olives in the tree itself. It was, uh, you know, 30 feet high. And um, the tree produced, it produced a lot of olives that September. And my second daughter was born in that September. Her name was, we named her Olivia in honor of, this, of the olive harvest. And then that winter, it was the coldest winter we've ever had. It went to 12 below zero. And the olive tree was not just killed to the ground, it was killed permanently. So despite the demise of her, uh, her namesake, uh, Olivia remains the feistiest of children. <laughs> She's, uh, she turns 19 tomorrow and she goes to college at St. Lawrence University where I'm going to visit her tomorrow in Canton. So that's um, my story of Jefferson the olive. But he, um, he loved, um, you know, he liked the olive oil and he, he loved the olive tree, but um, um, you, you can't really, we, we grow it today um, in pots and uh, they'll really stand cold temperatures. We have some olives that you know, we usually keep them out until it goes below um, uh, 20 degrees. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a good question about getting plants from Native Americans, but no, uh, there's no record of him getting plants. But he get he got a lot of traditions from Native Americans, and uh, in doing this book, you'll you'll see, for example, that um, um, the most regal of the Virginia aristocrats, people like George Washington or this fellow named John Taylor, they have these um, garden diaries, and um, they never talk about, for example, planting hills, which. Europeans got from the Indians that practice, but Jefferson was always planting things in hills and more vernacular middle-class gardeners were always talking about hills. They were more attuned, I guess, to um, the, uh, the tradition that became an American tradition of planting cucumbers and melons and squashes and, uh, and lima beans in hills, uh, manured, often filled and often composted and specially prepared sites. So. Um, um, but oh, there's not, there's other greats. There's the Lewis and Clark plants. Um, gosh, um, so he did get plants from, seeds from the Indians. When Meriwether Lewis went north or went west, um, um, they collected a lot of seeds, uh, agricultural seeds from Northern Plains Indian tribes, the Mandan, the Arikara, and the Hidatsa tribes. And in the winter of 1804, 1805, they stayed at a place called Fort Mandan in the, what's now North Dakota. And um, this was really a sophisticated Indian agriculture in the sense that a lot of these uh, bean and squash and corn varieties and even tobacco varieties were really heavily uh, bred and improved by the North American Indians to grow in this really harsh climate in the northern plains where there's no rainfall hardly in the summertime when there's a two-month growing season. And so Jefferson got seeds of an Arikara bean and uh, four or five different Indian corn varieties and uh, a tobacco and uh, even a squash variety that were brought back by Meriwether Lewis uh, from the Lewis and Clark expedition. He grew them in his garden in Monticello. And this yellow Arikara bean was really a short season bean, so it had you know, a lot of desirable products. It would produce a bean in, in, I don't know, I think it was 40 days or something. And uh, Jefferson wrote to his favorite nurseryman, he said, well, this, this Arikara bean is a great bean, but I got one that's a little bit better, so I'm gonna discard it. Um, it could have been a moon rock. And here he was um, discarding because it wasn't quite good enough to his um, to his high standards. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, Sally Hemmings is. You know, y'all y'all know who Sally Hemmings is. Um, Sally Hemmings was a uh, uh, Jefferson's. Uh, uh, she was the half sister of his half sister, actually. And uh, the story goes that Jefferson fathered children by Sally Hemings. And um, um, she's mentioned in Jefferson's um, records, but not in any kind of special way. Uh, she was like among, she was Sally, she was working in the weaver's cottage. Uh, she was given so much corn this year and so, many, so much uh, wheat and so many, um, so many yards of cloth. And um, um, I think five years ago, we actually... Uh, broke the story at Monticello. A man did a DNA study of the Jefferson family and compared it to the Hemings family and, and, and the DNA suggested very strongly that, that Sally Hemings' uh, children were the result of a Jefferson male member. And it was probably Thomas Jefferson, but we'll probably never absolutely know for sure. Um, but, you know, the last question in the end of all dinner parties, it always ends up talking about Sally Hemings. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so it's, you know, it's a fascinating story. Uh, you know, Monticello is, um, you know, we, we pride ourselves that scholarship drives our mission, and wherever the, wherever the story goes, we, we follow it. And um, um, so it's a, it's a fascinating story, and um, it reveals a little bit of the humanity of Thomas Jefferson, but also opens yourself to just worlds of speculation about these intersections of black and white worlds. Well, Peter has...